So uh, today, uh, as I mentioned, we will discuss the biodefense and infectious diseases funding opportunities. What I really try to do is uh, give you an overview of what are the various pockets of money available, uh, where you could potentially be sending your uh, applications. I will focus primarily <clears throat> on the National Institutes of Health, uh, once again with uh, an emphasis on uh, NIAID, National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, not surprisingly. I will also uh, share some opportunities in the uh, other uh, government agencies such as uh, BARDA and uh, the Department of Defense as well, uh, DITRA, DARPA, U.S. Army. Uh, primarily, uh, the, the, those, are the, um, those, are, those are the primary areas where one can find such pockets of money. Uh, first though, uh, what I would like to um, do is <clears throat> share with you who FreeMind is. Uh, and generally, if you aren't aware, if you are, haven't uh, encountered or, or, or been on a webinar previously, essentially we are a consulting firm. What we try to do is um, help our clients get as much money as possible from non-dilutive sources. Uh, this primarily translates into grants and contracts uh, from uh, government agencies, NIH, Department of Defense, as I mentioned. We do work with all the players in the life sciences, across the life sciences, with academics, universities, medical centers, research institutes, and industry. Could be a small startup, a couple of folks at home, uh, all the way to members of large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have a, a team of uh, 35 full-time employees, been doing this for uh, 14 years now. Submit roughly 250 applications every single year. So there's a very large knowledge base there and, and expertise that has accumulated over time. Uh, basically what we try to do, and, uh, and I will go into further detail towards the end of the presentation uh, regarding our methodology, and, and of course you're welcome to uh, uh, Try it at home, uh, share it with your loved ones. Uh, what we try to do is uh, help you identify the most uh, uh, relevant funding opportunities, outlining a granting strategy for you, strategizing how to maximize the application's chances for award. Uh, we would also, also, of course, manage complex uh, project production processes such as multi-PI, multi-component uh, uh, applications. Uh, the application writing process is a joint effort, and I will share more on that uh, towards the end. And uh, yes, in the case of contracts, we would assist with the final contract negotiations. Now, when one looks at the NIH budget, and I am focusing uh, first and foremost on the NIH uh, because that is a fantastic source of funding, uh, $30.9 billion. Yes, the obvious question that comes to mind is what is going on with the sequestration? Uh, so the truth of the matter is that uh, well, most likely 2013 awards will not uh, be affected heavily. Uh, maybe just a bit of delay in the uh, uh, in the notice. Uh, we are expecting 2014 a slight uh, decrease. Uh, I believe NIH uh, was 5%, I think, or maybe settled on 5.6% in the end. So take 5.6% off 30 billion is not a huge loss, although it is uh, we, a loss in itself. Looking at the pie in front of you, uh, 16 billion, 16.5 billion go to research projects, uh, followed by research centers grants, uh, R&D contracts, essentially most of the, the, of, uh, of the source of funding actually goes externally out of the NIH, uh, extramural uh, research, whereas internally and intramural research and uh, other uh, efforts are only a small portion. Now where is all this money going? Uh, in front of you you can see a, a graph with uh, various areas of, of interest. Um, basically, these are not mutually exclusive, so they do not add up to $30.9 billion. Uh, but what I do want to show you here is two things. First of all, you can see that the uh, between fiscal year 2012, 2013, and the estimated 2014, we aren't seeing a huge difference in these uh, between the years for each program. They stay relatively uh, the same. Infectious diseases awarded close to $4 billion uh, last year. Um, just as a comparison, cancer a little under six billion dollars, and I did opt to leave in the more relevant uh, areas uh, relevant to our audience, so you can uh, pick out your uh, relevant area and try to see uh, how much money you could potentially be targeting. In terms of infectious diseases awards, um, from 2010 onwards, it's been fairly constant. So close to four billion dollars awarded uh, from uh, for, for infectious diseases. And once again, we are, anticipa are not anticipating a huge uh, difference uh, in, in this type of graph. So uh, those of you out there in the infectious diseases area, there's a substantial pocket of money. Uh, in terms of NIAID, uh, what NIAID uh, uh, does, well, it's pretty evident from their name. Uh, they focus on allergies and infectious diseases. 
uh, basic research, applied research. Um, basically, they're trying to prevent infectious diseases, immunological and allergic diseases. Uh, notice that the NIAID budget uh, slightly decreased um, over the last three years, but then again remained rel is remaining relatively constant, and uh, we don't anticipate a, a, mark a marked shift in that in the future. In terms of uh, ways one can approach these pockets of money, there are several ways, there are several uh, routes. The first and, and most logical one, I think the one that uh, individuals mostly uh, are targeting, are the solicited opportunities. So you're looking, uh, you have your own bug, uh, you have the search engine of the NIH, or perhaps you can Google it, and you search for your bug and you hope to find a solicitation that covers those activities. And uh, yes, there are, there are many solicitations that uh, target very specific areas of interest and uh, your, your bug or your activity could be in that solicitation. That said, solicitations or solicited opportunities account for roughly 20% of awards. The remaining awards, uh, or 80% uh, roughly, are unsolicited to mean they use the investigator-initiated route, an investigator-initiated R21, an investigator-initiated R01, investigator-initiated SBIR, and some more uh, other broad uh, solicitations that uh, could be uh, construed as uh, sort of um, semi-unsolicited. Uh, what we try to do on our end, and you can do the same, is try to establish interest uh, prior to submitting. Try to engage program officers, see if what you're proposing is of interest to the granting agency, is relevant to their mission. Perhaps they funded similar work. Uh, perhaps uh, they have a, a specific solicitation just for that that you perhaps missed. A third route that one could uh, pursue it's more of the broad agency announcements. I, I write brace yourself because it, these are tough. Uh, it's a huge effort. Uh, anyone who's ever uh, undertaken uh, or, or, or faced a BAA uh, head-on would probably be nodding in uh, an appreciation right now. Uh, not easy. Uh, usually uh, could be several hundred pages long, and I will touch upon that later. And I am sharing with you quite a few BAAs today, primarily in the Department of Defense and uh, BARDA as well. Uh, I would like to make one uh, distinction here between contracts and grants. Grants, as uh, um, a deputy director of, of uh, uh, <laughs> one of the institutes I'll, I'll share with you today, said to me, uh, a grant is a gift from the government. Uh, essentially, you're getting money, taking it away from you is very, very difficult. So uh, they trust you, they give you money, and uh, you carry out your research. Contract is a contract. You are contracted to to uh, complete a set of scientific activities, and uh, you are expected to complete those activities on time, on budget. So the first uh, opportunities I'd like to discuss are the uh, preclinical opportunities from the NIH. Now, what I tried to do, or, or rather one of our listeners here today, uh, Dr. Katz, one of our analysts, what she tried to do is really give you more of a, a broad uh, uh, insight into the funding landscape. We tried to show some uh, R, R21, R1s, uh, some SBIRs in different areas, and it's really a taste of, of what the funding landscape is able to offer. Keep in mind, once more, and I will step back, uh, if you do pursue uh, an uh, unsolicited opportunity, uh, so you could be generating interest within multiple funding sources to mean that it could be a joint effort between NIAID, for example, or maybe uh, um, Heart and Lung Institute, if that's uh, what you are uh, peddling. So uh, it's these these uh, solicitations I'll show you now. Most of them are from NIAD. Uh, one is uh, does have several agencies participating, and it could go to either one of those. Uh, the first one would be the Counteract program. This one uh, is an R21, so an early exploratory proof of concept type work, uh, countermeasures against chemical threats, and uh, uh, basically developmental projects in translational research. So it's, it's a non-standard R21 in terms of the dollar value. We're looking at half a million dollars over a two-year period. Uh, fairly simple to, to comprehend. We're looking at chemical threats, so uh, nerve agents uh, such as serin, VX. Uh, it could even be toxic industrial chemical and, and toxic agricultural chemicals. Notice the non-standard due date. It is January 30th. Uh, once again, no need for uh, any preliminary data. It is really a proof of concept generating uh, uh, type of application. And there are multiple agencies that are participating in this endeavor. Similar but different, uh, this is a U01, a cooperative agreement. Uh, what does that mean? That means that you are in tight connection with the granting uh, agency. 
Uh, they are looking very carefully at your uh, research plan. They're looking very carefully at your milestones. They would like to see you uh, visit with them periodically to discuss the project. It's a very hands-on type mechanism. This uh, U01 is from NIAID. It is essentially the same uh, effort here. However, it does require a more substantial body of evidence. Of course, it, it is more advanced and it is uh, the counteract against uh, chemical threats. Uh, the dollar value uh, depends on, on the, the scope of work. Uh, we're looking at about uh, up to two and a half millions, two half million dollars over five years. And they are uh, essentially looking for uh, to develop <clears throat> new and improved therapeutics for chemical threats, which is what we mentioned just now. In terms of submission, uh, this one is an annual uh, event. So we're looking at September 16, 2013, uh, the closest deadline. Don't miss it if you are relevant. I will now revert to the SBIR STTR mechanism. This specifically is an STTR from NIAID. It's the Advanced Technology STTR, uh, $300,000 over a two-year period. In other words, if you require some more cash uh, to uh, get you going, it does differ from the, the standard SBIR or the Omnibus SBIR in that it is, uh, well, twice the dollar value. Uh, the phase one is up to two years, and then the, uh, the phase um, Two would be up to three years, one million dollars per year. So this is a very, very nice, very, very nice uh, dollar value. Uh, they are looking for advanced technology projects that require a longer award period, as I mentioned, and greater award amount. Uh, those that are allowed. Um, so they do uh, refer to advanced technology as a clearly identified. So this is not a fishing expedition. This is not a uh, <clears throat> a, um, a target uh, validation. It's, it's more about uh, uh, taking the uh, validated uh, uh, target further. So, and they will only review applications that meet the uh, advanced technology definition. Note that in the STTR, a company is or does have to be responsible for at least 40% of the work. Next deadline, August 5th. If you hurry, you can make it. Otherwise, go ahead and submit in December. It's very similar. This would be the SBIR uh, advanced technology from NIAID. Uh, similar deadline, similar dollar value. Uh, essentially, the, the main difference is that uh, the company does have to carry out at least 60% of the work in-house. Well, uh, it's debatable how that is calculated, but then again, it's up to the program officer to ultimately decide whether you are carrying out 60% of the work. In other words, uh, you can go ahead and submit, but if you're not and the program officer um, would, would uh, believe as much, uh, you could perhaps not get the award. So be very careful. By the way, a lot of people ask us, and the answer is to the question that you'll understand momentarily, yes, you can uh, uh, suggest renting lab space uh, once the award is made. So you don't have to have uh, the uh, lab space uh, upon submission. Another SBIR from NIAID, uh, August 5th deadline, uh, one standard de due date, so December 5th would be the next one. It's the Radiological Nuclear Medical Countermeasures uh, Product Development. Um, funding cannot exceed 300000 total cost per Phase 1 award, and $1 million for Phase 2. Uh, the idea is countermeasures uh, against uh, uh, radiological nuclear um, activities uh, against those... Uh, well, product development against its activities. Uh, the idea would be to uh, bring you to an IND or ID uh, to the F, uh, package to the FDA. This is non-clinical. We're looking at preclinical product development, and uh, the idea would, once again would be to advance new medical countermeasures towards a phase one clinical trial, safety studies, GLP animal model, pivotal efficacy studies, and a FDA licensure. A couple of uh, clinical programs, we get asked this a lot. Um, people are constantly looking for the large dollar value. They want the, uh, to, to cover their uh, phase one and phase two, and, and some are even looking for phase three uh, dollars within the NH. A little more difficult, and I will show you some uh, uh, opportunities that you can. Uh, the, first, the first one is the NIAID clinical, well, I'll, I'll rephrase. Uh, this would be a preliminary step to the actual uh, award for the clinical trial. This is a planning grant. It's only $150,000 for one year. The idea is to help you uh, prepare the activities towards submitting the, uh, the, the full proposal. So we're looking at the rationale of the trial, we're looking at the design, the protocol, um, any of the elements that go uh, that are part of designing a clinical study. 
Um, essentially, if you can already show that you have prepared the necessary uh, documentation and necessary uh, um, elements for, for the clinical study, you can go ahead and submit an R1 or a U1. However, I would strongly urge you to speak with the program officer or the contract officer to ensure that you uh, are or will be welcomed in open arms. Uh, so, uh, although a great mechanism to uh, fund those activities, uh, you could go ahead and skip directly to the year one, for example, and it does have an R1 equivalent, and I'll, 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 share, uh, I'll describe what the difference is. Uh, in terms of the year one here, the NIAID Clinical Trial Implementation Cooperative Agreement, once again, it's a cooperative agreement to mean that there's a lot of hands-on from NIAID on this one. Uh, I would definitely uh, gain pre-approval or make sure you do you, you are uh, accepted uh, with the program officer at least 10 weeks prior to the deadline. The funding, I mean, generally it's not capped, but then again, uh, they would strongly urge you to remain within the half a million dollars per year for up to five years, but then again, no, it, it is not capped. Um, so these are investigator initiated, and the, I, I, I do want to stress the high risk element of these clinical trials. And, you know, one could argue that, well, most clinical trials are high risk. We are looking at novel molecules, uh, sometimes novel uh, mechanisms of action. So usually we are looking at high risk uh, clinical trials. You are highly encouraged to add some mechanistic studies on the side. Uh, that always bodes well for the application and, and we would uh, suggest you do so. Um, in terms of the R1 equivalent, so they are really trying to support low risk or uh, low risk clinical trials. Uh, it's the uh, NIAID Clinical Trial Implementation Grant from the R1 uh, mechanism. Notice the non-standard due dates here as well. I do want to uh, devote a few minutes to BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It is also under the HHS. Um, oops, HSS, HHS. Um, and um, the reason I, I want to share this with you because BARDA, what they are trying to essentially do is bridge the, the famous valley of death uh, between what the NIH is able to fund, which is the discovery, the preclinical, uh, could go into phase one as well, and then to hand it off uh, to, uh, well, uh, stockpiling and then uh, um, of, of uh, countermeasures. So BARDA would, uh, would take you through uh, usually phase two and three. Uh, they could also go to phase one and on very rare occasions. They could uh, dip further back into the process and uh, uh, get some data going for, for some in interesting projects. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with BARDA, uh, what they do are uh, they develop and procure medical countermeasures in the CBRN area, so the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, um, anything to do with accident, incidents, attacks. They also focus strongly on influenza and any emerging infectious diseases. Now, uh, as it were, BARDA at the moment does not have an open solicitation. They did uh, release a pre-solicitation uh, regarding the influenza program. So uh, keep an eye out if you are in the influenza space, keep an eye out for the, full, uh, for the uh, release solicitation. We do anticipate that the uh, uh, CBRN countermeasures, the Advanced Research Development of Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear, uh, opportunity will be reissued. Uh, we suspect that will be uh, soon, as well as the science and technology platform applied to the medical countermeasures program. Uh, once again, uh, the, the typical uh, stepwise approach here is that they issue the pre-solicitation, they let everyone know uh, to get ready, and then they go ahead and, and, and provide the full solicitations. In terms of the, uh, the process, the submission process, uh, I, I did group these together, the typical DOD and, and BARDA submission process. Uh, one word about BARDA, we highly recommend that you, if you don't have a direct line with them, uh, to go ahead and, and, and try to uh, uh, get a TechWatch meeting going. Just go online to the BARDA website and, and uh, try to uh, uh, secure a space. They, they're very good about this. They, they will get back to you uh, very quickly and you can uh, meet with them and uh, try to discuss your projects, see if it's of interest to them, relevant to them, and they'll tell you whether it's uh, ready for BARDA or not. Notice these are more advanced projects. Uh, or they could tell you to get some more data together. Um, once you do have the, uh, the tech watch behind you, this is in the case of BARDA only, uh, what the, the, the typical stepwise approach would be, uh, first off, a white paper submission. Uh, of course, uh, well, the white paper is, is typically about two pages, maybe five pages. Some mechanisms are even ten pages long. Uh, really is a high-level overview of the project, the specific aims, what milestones you're hoping to achieve, what's the unmet area, uh, the, uh, unmet uh, need here, uh, really high level. 
Now, keep uh, in mind that the majority of applications, or, or in other words, it's very difficult to pass the white paper stage to mean that if you're called to submit a full application, your chances do increase dramatically. Yes, you still do have to pass the full application as well as the negotiation, uh, but then again, you're, you're well on your way. Uh, in terms of the uh, second step, if, the R, if your white paper is favorably reviewed, you would be entering the full application stage. Um, as low as 45 days to complete that, upwards of 90 days to complete a full application. So uh, once you get called, you have to hit the ground running. After you do submit the full application, uh, it is reviewed for technical merit. And uh, if they are, if it's favorably reviewed, then uh, they would discuss the dollars with you and uh, hopefully make an award. Uh, the fine print uh, says they can actually drag you out for uh, up to two years. <laughs> so keep that in mind. A few Department of Defense opportunities. I am focusing on the U.S. Army, DITRA, and DARPA. These are the most relevant to our audience today. Um, relevant uh, to this extent that it, we are looking at uh, the bio defense and the infectious diseases area. I will start with DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, the, they do have three relevant solicitations out right now for our audience. Uh, the first one is the basic research for combating weapons of mass destruction or counter uh, weapons uh, uh, measures of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, notice in all of these that the budgets are not capped. It really has to reflect the scope of work. And they are what, focusing on basic research projects. So uh, the mission of DITRA is to safeguard the uh, America and its allies from weapons of mass destruction to mean chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and high yield explosive um, and, and w with these various countermeasures. So, the projects always have to be related to the DITRA mission. In terms of uh, industry, yes, you are eligible as an, an industry uh, uh, player. That said, keep in mind that you should or you have to be uh, basic research oriented um, as well as you have to uh, provide 30% participation by an academic. I, I think the, the, the basis here is that they do expect the basic research coming from the academics. And you can uh, look down at the, at the bottom of the screen at the uh, uh, strategic thrust areas um, and of course you can go and online and, and take a closer look to see if you are relevant to what they're looking for. Uh, the second solicitation from DITRA that uh, is, is also of high interest would, uh, would be the R&D Innovation and Systems Engineering Office Science and Technology New Initiatives. Uh, once again, no, no cap in the budgets. Um, the idea is to develop and demonstrate and uh, transition timely and effective chemical and biological defense solutions such as pretreatments, therapeutics, diagnostics, detection, protection, medical uh, effects, modeling, systems biology, etc., etc. So uh, if anyone is in, 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 in the, uh, under the mission of DITRA and uh, you have a solution for one of these topics, then you should definitely explore this. Uh, DITRA don't go too far into the, or, or too advanced into the development, but rather um, it, it's once again to transition um, uh, projects. Okay. The third application from DITRA would be the fundamental research to counter weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the long-term challenges that offer a significant contribution to the current body of knowledge, to the understanding of the phenomena and observable facts, to significantly advance revolutionary technology, to new concepts for technology application or that may have impact on future uh, counter weapons of mass destruction threat or re reduction or capabilities. Uh, that is out of the solicitation. So just read very, very carefully, see if you are relevant. What I perceive to be most relevant for you in terms of thrust area would be the science for protection. Uh, read carefully and see, see if you are. One uh, thing that I do want to note, and that is in regards to all of these uh, DOD and BART as well, is the technology readiness level. In each one of these BAAs, they specify exactly and specifically what technology readiness level you have to be at in order to submit, not too early, not too advanced. Note also that there are different uh, lists of technology readiness levels, so don't confuse uh, the U.S. Army list with the DITRA list with the BARDA list. Make sure that uh, you are uh, uh, looking at the correct one, and also make sure that you are responsive to the application. One more uh, opportunity from the U.S. Army, another opportunity rather, uh, from this one from the U.S. Army, uh, definitely a, a local favorite here. This is the uh, broad agency announcement uh, from, from USAMRIC. Uh, budgets are not capped. The idea is to provide solutions to medical problems of importance to the American warfighter. So yes, there has to be a military angle here. And you can uh, review quickly the research areas of interest. 
when you do read the solicitation, uh, you will notice that the language is fairly broad. It'll never say, or uh, we don't anticipate it to say, uh, the exact uh, uh, solution that you are proposing. Hence the broad agency, uh, uh, lang uh, the broad language in the BAA. So what uh, the best thing to do would be to put together a white paper that you perceive to be the response uh, or the solution for the uh, areas of interest and gauge the interest of, uh, of, the, of the SAMRIC. Um, if they are not terribly responsive after the uh, solicitation uh, has gone out, so the best way to correspond with them is through white paper submissions. And uh, in these cases, uh, no news is typically good news. Uh, if they do not like it, they usually let you know fairly quickly. Uh, in terms of category A, B, or C priority pathogens, if that does not ring a bell, uh, just uh, go online, uh, take a look. Uh, it's a list of pathogens that are of interest to DITRA. They're uh, categorized as A, B, or C. Um, uh, all of those will be or should be submitted to DITRA and not using this BAA. Uh, another uh, interesting um, uh, funding agency is DARPA, a bit of a mystery for, for many, uh, the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, what the guys at DARPA are looking at is, is highly innovative research proposals uh, that are, of course, relevant to uh, national security, defense national security. Uh, they're looking for very unconventional approaches that are outside the mainstream, um, very high risk, so even a 1% chance of success uh, or, or uh, meeting uh, the, the milestones. They're really looking for radical uh, changes. In terms of the areas of interest, you're welcome to, to uh, read through those, uh, see if anything is relevant to you. This is actually a good time to mention that this webinar is taped and uh, will be uh, most likely on our YouTube channel uh, and you will all receive uh, the link to that and you can uh, uh, review it and we'll also send you uh, the uh, slide deck as well. In terms of challenges, uh, I did mention earlier that the white paper submission for these types of awards is not trivial. Uh, first, you have to uh, establish if you are responsive. Uh, to, uh, of course, read carefully through the BAA um, uh, to try to maybe gauge uh, contract officers when possible, although not uh, always. Definitely, definitely adhere to the guidelines. Uh, print out the, the BAA, read through it very, very carefully. Outline all the items, all the uh, different uh, elements. If something, uh, if you don't understand uh, one of the elements, uh, don't uh, shrug it off as unimportant. <laughs> it most likely is. So uh, what you could do is submit your uh, question to the contract officer. Uh, they will perhaps uh, issue an amendment with an answer to your question and clarify any uh, uh, misunderstandings or, or uh, issues that need uh, clarification. Um, of course, your science has to be compelling. Uh, I, I say this all the time. What wins awards is uh, strong science, is the best science. That's what wins. Uh, are, you, are you innovative? Do you have the, right, the correct leadership, the strong leadership uh, in place? Uh, in terms of these large-scale uh, applications, there are many unique sections that I just mentioned uh, that are, are not standard. Uh, definitely uh, make sure you, you have all those in place and, and accounted for and, and prepared to the best of, of your ability. There's a, a huge effort in, in terms of project management. Typically, these types of awards um, are, are multifaceted, multi-PI, uh, multi-centered, so it's uh, quite difficult to source all the information from all, all these sources um, and uh, coordinate, coordinating the, uh, the writing process towards these short timelines does become uh, uh, challenging. Uh, I do want to take a step back towards the NIH, and, and this actually um, applies for, for any grant that you submit in this space. Um, when you are submitting the, the grant, uh, you do have to always take into consideration what the NIH is looking at or the other uh, granting agencies. Uh, what they're looking at um, is, first and foremost, uh, they're, they're weighing the, the, the risk uh, to, uh, in front of the, the strength. In other words, they're looking at what sort of strengths your application has and what sort of risks. And if you outweigh the, the risk, uh, then your chances of, of award go up. How do you do so? Uh, well, five different elements that uh, they're looking at. Uh, the first one that we'll discuss is leadership. Do you have the expertise? Does the PI have the expertise uh, to uh, oversee this type of project? Do the uh, key personnel have the experience? If uh, they don't, perhaps you need to bring on a collaborator, a subcontractor. Can the environment uh, support this type of work? Uh, for example, your lab space, if it cannot, then maybe you should collaborate with the university that does have the necessary um, uh, activities uh, in-house that you can carry out there. Of course, this is significant to public health. Is it of highly, uh, is, does it have a high innovation factor? 
Um, and first and foremost, uh, undoubtedly, would be the scientific approach. What ultimately wins grants is not the four elements that I just described. Yes, they do have to be up to par. They have to be strong. But what wins grants is a top quality scientific approach. It has to be well structured, well laid out, um, and uh, I'll describe how we do so a little later in the, uh, <clears throat> in the presentation. Um, notice there's another, I, I did put down here, responsiveness versus competitiveness. Um, so you do definitely have to be responsive. Uh, if you're not responsive, no, you will not win. Uh, but you also have to be competitive. And that's what these five factors are really weighing against the risk. So how does one maximize chances for award? Well, first of all, know what the agencies are looking to fund. Uh, if uh, BARDA, uh, by some, for some uh, reason, stops uh, being interested in taking flu uh, uh, projects forward, perhaps it's not the time to submit to BARDA. Uh, is, if NIDA is interested in a specific bug these days that's gaining some uh, uh, traction in the field, well, maybe this is your chance. Uh, of course, you have to focus your project application, a, a discrete start point, a discrete end point. Uh, keep in mind that uh, none of these granting agencies fund companies or fund labs. They fund projects. Uh, so uh, uh, don't be overly ambitious. Uh, try to, to uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, keep, once again, the, the project uh, a discrete start and end uh, point for the project. Definitely ask for what is necessary in terms of budget. Uh, don't ask for too much because you will, <laughs> they will, it will be scrutinized. Uh, don't ask for too little. They will think you are, uh, don't know what you are doing. Uh, definitely present a complete project. And I did mention that, uh, uh, I touched upon that earlier. If you have any gaps in your capabilities, gaps in, in your knowledge, definitely collaborate, uh, bring on subcontractors, uh, consultants. And that also <clears throat> is connected to uh, leveraging on research collaborations. NIH uh, loves research collaborations, be it uh, industry-industry, academic-academic, uh, or industry-academic. Uh, anything to uh, present a more complete project, uh, both in expertise and the scope, is, uh, is, uh, bodes well for the application. I, <clears throat> I showed you today several pockets of money, several mechanisms. I showed you proof of concept. I showed you uh, clinical uh, work. I showed you translational work. There are different sizes of awards in these different success rates, try to take a look at uh, what those are, see what's, uh, uh, where, where it's less risky for you. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, some uh, uh, projects may not have the exact right target, but then again, you could always uh, submit an uh, investigator-initiated type work and try to target it to the relevant uh, uh, granting agency. Uh, definitely conduct a thorough strategic assessment, and, and that will be uh, one of my next slides, and I'll describe how we go ahead and do it, and uh, you can try to do the same uh, at home. A quick, uh, just to remind you who, who's, who's speaking with you today, uh, the uh, NIH team, uh, we are 35 full-time employees on staff. Um, we have a, a small group of analysts who conduct these strategic assessments that I'll describe uh, shortly. And then we have managers and writers that uh, uh, essentially uh, see you through to submission. Uh, this is led, uh, the team is led by uh, several uh, very competent individuals. Uh, Guy Harchen would be uh, the manager of the professional department. Uh, and Joel would be the manager of the consulting services, and uh, the trustee uh, analyst, uh, Dr. Geva, Dr. Katz, and we are missing uh, um, one more here, that's uh, uh, Dr. Gordzowski. In terms of the process, and um, I say this jokingly, there's no IP here. Uh, you're welcome to try it out tonight around the dinner table with, uh, with your kids, uh, see what comes out. Basically, what we're trying to do is uh, take you through two uh, core services, core elements of, of our activities. The first one would be the strategic assessment, uh, the uh, identification of funding opportunities, if you will. What we try to do is generate a long-term strategic approach. Uh, I'll, I'll be blunt. Submitting one application, sitting back for 10 months uh, to see what happens is not a granting strategy. Um, I don't want to break it to you. You will most likely not win. Uh, it, it's really, it really necessitates a headstrong approach, multi-submission strategy, uh, putting in several applications, getting reviewed, getting feedback, and uh, yes, being punched uh, on occasion as well and standing back up. Uh, how do we do this? Our analysts um, that I just mentioned, they would be looking at your pipeline. What are the projects that you have in-house? Um, what uh, are the R&D activities associated with those projects? They then, they, they then link those uh, R&D activities with available pockets of money. So for example, uh, activities one and two could be comparable to a, a very nice R21. Uh, then again, if you have more uh, substantial body of evidence, we could take five tasks, 
tasks together and maybe put together an RO one. Uh, we will discuss uh, solicited versus unsolicited. And the initial outcome, and I do stress the word initial, is a map of, of, of relevant funding opportunities. We then take that map and translate it into a granting strategy, which uh, uh, ultimately is a multi-submission, long-term uh, strategic uh, uh, approach of a granting strategy. The second core service is the actual grant production process. You'd be working with one of our grants consultants. Um, what they would do is draft comprehensive templates based on the solicitation guideline, based on 14 years of experience, uh, based also on any information you already have, which could be plugged in in the relevant area. Uh, these templates uh, serve as a basis for uh, uh, an ongoing feedback, a territory review type uh, work where we would send the templates to the client uh, and then uh, uh, where the client would insert the, the relevant information sent back to us for, for the uh, review. We are the expert grant writers to mean we ask questions, insert comments, rewrite sections. Uh, we just keep sending it back until we feel uh, we get it right. Um, we discuss budgetary issues, scope of work. Uh, we convert all the information into one coherent, scientifically sound application, uh, package it neatly, and then we send it off. Uh, just to summarize these activities, uh, three realms here. Of course, the client with their R&D funding needs on the top left. Uh, we then translate those funding needs into a multi-submission granting strategy, execute that granting strategy in, in the near term, I would say six months, uh, through the grant production process, so submission of applications. Uh, and this strategy is reviewed constantly after submission. We uh, revert back and see if uh, we need to refine this approach. And uh, finally, uh, uh, the project will be reviewed. Hopefully, dollars will be awarded and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and round and round and round we go. Uh, th that was uh, uh, Green Mind in a nutshell. I hope, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I do want to mention that you can ask questions if you like. I, Probably should have mentioned that earlier on. Uh, you can go ahead and type that into the uh, um, uh, question box, t uh, chat box if you want as well, and I'll go ahead and answer any questions. Um, thank you very much for, for logging on, and of course, uh, I will stick around if uh, some questions do come in. Okay, so I'm... I'm Okay, great. Okay, I'm getting some thanks. Thanks to you guys as well. <laughs> um, great. Okay. Well, in terms of uh, yes, that, that that is a valid a valid question. Uh, in terms of the SBIR, yes, the rules have changed. I will actually give a webinar on that. Um, um, I will give a, give a webinar a webinar on that later uh, this month on the SBIR STTR new regulations and and of course funding opportunities. Um, the new regulations uh, stipulate that um, that uh, VC-backed companies are eligible as well, uh, but not a single VC or a single investor, but rather multiple investors or multiple VCs uh, are uh, eligible. This was uh, finalized a few weeks ago when um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the rules uh, for finally came out. So yes, any VC-backed companies uh, that are interested can definitely go ahead and, uh, and submit. Um, okay, so um, yes, very good question regarding uh, academic uh, versus you, uh, uh, academia versus uh, industry. Um, everything I showed you today, uh, besides the basic research for the um, uh, DITRA award, everything I showed you today does allow industry to submit as well. So it's not restricted to academia at all. Uh, of course, the SBIR is only for industry. Uh, the cooperative agreements uh, industry can submit as well. The R21 as well, the R01 as well. So really very, very few solicitations, unless they state otherwise, uh, do actually limit you to uh, uh, academics only. Another question regarding eligibility. Um, I see there, uh, okay, question regarding non-US. Um, everything I showed you today as well uh, allows non-US organizations to submit as well. So no restrictions on that. Um, the main difference would be the percent overhead uh, non-US organization can request if a company uh, typically requests 35, 40% overhead. Academics, by the way, uh, have negotiated rates of 50, 70, 80, 100% overhead. Uh, uh, European or non-US rather can only request 8% overhead. 
Um, so that, that would be the main limitation. You, you would have to also provide a foreign justification, uh, and I trust that would be uh, um, based on your expertise, um, IP, etc. So there's a question here regarding um, are pharma responses favored over device countermeasures? Um, well, of course, it depends on what, uh, what's the unmet need. Uh, there are uh, solicitations uh, that look at devices, and there are uh, solicitations that will look at pharmacological uh, countermeasures. So, so the answer is not necessarily. It really depends on, on, the, on the unmet need and, of course, how your solution is, is fits the best. If you are uh, a cheaper, faster, better, then yes, uh, your solution would be favored. So it's really a question of, uh, of fit, of responsiveness and competitiveness. A moment, screening through some more questions. Uh, okay, a lot, a lot of thank yous. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm getting a question about uh, fee structures. Um, uh, essentially, FreeMind, uh, most of our clients do work on a retainer base. Uh, we don't limit the number of projects we'll review. We don't limit the number of submissions that we'll uh, take the client uh, forward with. Of course, it depends on the pipeline, the size of the pipeline. Um, the number of anticipated projects, um, just to give an example, um, a, a biotech of, of two to five projects w w would uh, pay roughly $4,000 a month, uh, whereas a much larger organization uh, would, pay, would pay more. I hope, I hope that helps. Um, if awarded, we do take a success fee on the back end of uh, 5%. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting a question regarding uh, the political landscape. Uh, the, uh, how does that affect uh, any of these awards? The truth of the matter is uh, no one knows. Um, I can share with you that uh, we have, we've had clients who uh, were uh, quote-unquote tied uh, to everyone and did not win, unfortunately. And we've had clients that uh, stay very low under the radar and, and did win. So uh, um, what I can tell you is that the days of earmarks, uh, people say, are over. Uh, and there's only so far a, a lobbyist can take you. After all, you do have to submit a top quality application. Uh, most likely, so um, what ultimately wins awards is the science. That's the truth. Okay, one moment. Okay, so the, uh, the some of the the um, SBIRs I showed you were non-standard SBIRs. So the uh, dollar value was higher than the standard SBIR, which is limited to one hundred fifty thousand dollars plus overhead. Where the average SBIR over the, well last year was roughly two twenty or two thirty. Um, so yes, these ones were specifically uh, larger. Okay. Okay, um, just to summarize, yes, I will send uh, the slide deck to everybody, uh, stay tuned. Um, we will also post this webinar online uh, in our YouTube channel. Uh, we are launching a new website as well uh, shortly with all of this information, you're welcome to view it. Um, happy to see you next week as well, uh, most likely cancer funding opportunities, if relevant to you of course, and uh, stay tuned for additional webinars. Thank you very much for joining and uh, have a good day.